Welcome inside with the insiders. I'm Tom Pellicero. There's a very happy Mike Garofolo, and right there, Ian Rappaport, who, if Instagram does not lie, Ian, not only did I see you doing TV hits on the field like seven hours before kickoff yesterday, did you actually stay in person for a real life NFL game? Yeah, it was uh, it was kind of awesome. I was there with my buddy Brent. He was going to the Giants game last night. I was there for NFL Network and for another reason, which we'll explain at a future Insiders show. Um, so it was cool. Ooh. Hung on the sideline, got to see our friend Jay Slater, uh, got to see Lil Uzi Vert, one of my favorite rappers who I just learned who he was yesterday, <laughs> and uh, watched <laughs> the game. And I got to say, the actual, like, Mike, you talk about how it's kind of like fun for us if the local team is good. It was cool that the Giants were 2-0 because the atmosphere was great. Uh, plus, where I was, wow, end zone right. angle, the actual view was kind of awesome. Um, you could really see everything. Like, I legitimately enjoyed my experience right up until it came time to leave and find the car. Uh, before that, it was great. How'd that walk to the car go, Ian? Not great. Um, not great. My <laughs> Couldn't find my guy. Um, he said he was waiting in the lift lot. I was in the Uber lot. Turns out the lift lot was across the street at the mall. So we had to go through the tunnel with like 5,000 other people, which was not great. And then we found a guy who was illegally selling beers like next to the tunnel. We bought two of those and drank it as we were walking from one end of the tunnel to another. That made it better. Ended up getting home about 1 a.m. Um, besides that, it was a fun experience, though. Ian, leaving out the part that he told us off air about how people wanted to take photos with him and he was very angry and wanted to fight them all, but still went ahead with the photos. So if you have something on your Instagram, a picture with Ian right now, just know that inside he's a ball of rage. Mike, what's your favorite Lil Lucy Vert song, by the way, before we get to the headlines? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> good Vibrations. That was him, Gotta right? like them all. Uh, let It Be. Yep. Right? Yep. Classic. And Agata DeVita. does a great job with those. Yep. All right. All right. Let's get to the headlines right now. We got some serious topics, too, this week as we head into week four in the NFL, starting out with the fact that Hurricane Ian is bearing down on the west coast of Florida. Buccaneers relocating to Miami for the week. They'll practice at the Dolphins facility. That game, as we tape this, still on Sunday night, Bucks chiefs in Tampa, but the NFL's got a lot of experience with this. They'll have contingency plans in place if they need to use them. Mike Tomlin today never asked in a 22-minute press conference who his starting quarterback is, but did say that Mitch Trubisky's improving in all areas. We'll dive into that in a second here. Defenseman Miles Garrett, very serious situation. A single car accident on Monday that left him in the hospital. Non-life-threatening injuries, but continuing to undergo tests here. The police say there was no signs of impairment. Everybody was wearing a seatbelt. If it's, there's ever a PSA for wear your seatbelt, this was probably that situation after he flipped yeah. his car multiple times, but emerged and is alive, thankfully, for Miles Garrett. Mac Jones also pretty severe high ankle sprain, as Ian and I reported on Monday. He's been getting additional opinions. Doesn't want to have surgery. Surgery is, cer surgery is certainly an option that could get him back onto the field sooner. And then Sterling Shepard, an injury coming out of the Monday night game, out for the season with a torn ACL. Mike, I want to get into that one with you in a second. But let's start with Ian here on Mac Jones. Situation where he's got a high ankle sprain, which as we know, that is ligament damage. It's torn ligaments in your ankle. Yeah. We all saw the viral photos of Mac, the amount of pain that he was in. He said in his press conference he hadn't suffered a real injury since he fell off the monkey bars and broke his arm. When guys haven't dealt with injuries, you don't entirely know how their bodies are going to respond. He wants to rehab, but give me a layout here in terms of the choices and what the realistic timeline is so we can even yeah. see Mac back on the field. So the choice is when you have significant ligament damage, essentially a really bad sprain, is you could just do rehab, which I think is what Mac Jones wants to do, be back in four, maybe six weeks. Sort of an extended absence, not what you want. Although, honestly, guys, I kind of feel like a young quarterback being forced to sit and watch, not the worst thing ever, even though he wants to play. So that's one option, rehab. The other option is tightrope surgery. And I kind of bungled this on TV yesterday, honestly. Dr. Norman Waldrop, who is the Saints team, one of the Saints team surgeons, uh, is the best known surgeon for performing and perfecting the tightrope procedure. Uh, I 
mention another surgeon. It was actually Dr. Waldrop. Anyway, that would be what Mac Jones would have if he was going to have surgery to tighten up the ligaments and make that secure. Potentially, that would quicken up the rehab and kind of limit the future uh, ankle issues. But it's surgery. No one wants surgery. Those are Mac Jones' options. Yeah, my understanding mm -hmm. is that... The, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, hold on. I'll, I'll hit real quick. My understanding is the hope is that uh, there won't be surgery. He'll rest. There's a potential for one of those PRP injections, platelet-rich plasma, where they take the blood and spin it and inserts more uh, red blood cells, I believe, uh, the healing cells. And the, the, the notion uh, is that that could help quicken things uh, as far as a timeline recovery. But uh, Mac Jones is going to be down for a while, as Ian mentioned. And uh, we'll see what the ultimate decision here is on how to proceed with this injury. Patriots at Packers on Sunday. The veteran Brian Hoyer in line to get that start. I believe the status has not won an NFL game since 2016. Obviously knows that system. It's been around forever. Ricky Bailey Zappi would be the backup. In Pittsburgh, Mike, we believe Mitch Trubisky is still the starting quarterback. There are questions still lingering about how long that lasts. It's a week-to-week -week evaluation here. Those questions were not asked of Mike Tomlin today, but he did have some things to say on Trubisky. Give me your sense of the situation here with the first-round pick, Kenny Pickett, looming behind him, too. Well, Mike Tomlin said that Mitchell Trubisky is improving in, quote, all areas, um, which I, I know that everybody's looking for the shiny new toy and Kenny Pickett, and they want to see him, and this offense doesn't seem like it's scoring that much more. Uh, but I, my understanding is that's what they believe, that his decision-making was much improved, that there were some drops and some misplays, such as a shovel pass uh, with a illegal downfield, illegal uh, offensive lineman downfield penalty that frustrated Mike Tomlin. It's like, well, if we didn't have these drops and uh, if guys you know, ran better routes in certain uh, areas, we would have had a better offensive performance and a better performance by Trubisky. But he took the shots down the field, which they wanted to see him do. Uh, and they feel like the decision-making has been much better. So they're going to continue to ride with Mitchell Trubisky, even though, as Tom noted, Mike Tomlin didn't outright say it. He was asked about, will there be any changes? And he said, well, you don't want to blow in the wind. The blow, blow in the wind. You don't want to blink. Uh, there are a couple other metaphors. Uh, but he also said he's open to it, right? So... I think that, the, you know, they're, they're, they're getting to the point where maybe they have to make a decision just to put Kenny Pickett in and see if that can spark the entire offense. Uh, but there will be no blowing in the wind or no blinking for Mike Tomlin this week. Mitchell Trubisky remains his starting quarterback. There's a lot of quotable lines every time Mike Tomlin talks. He's, he, nobody handles a press conference better and more fluidly in the entire league, I don't think, than Mike Tomlin in terms of just, like, every answer somehow. He's asked all these different questions and has, like, a bang-bang quotable thing for everything. Just makes people's jobs easy. Uh, real quick, Mike, too. Sterling Shepard, torn ACL, the latest setback for him in his career. And for the Giants now, it raises a lot of questions because for the second year in a row, we keep talking about Daniel Jones finally has all the weapons. We're going to find out what he really is. And now once again, look at the, the flukiness of this play. Once again now, he's got a bunch of guys who aren't there and Sterling Shepard down for the season. Yeah, it's just such a weird, I mean, he was jogging roughly as fast as I jog when I run outside for some exercise, which is not fast. Uh, it's one thing for a guy to get hitting his knee or he goes up and he comes down awkwardly or he's stopping on a dime and trying to reverse field like Odell Beckham uh, in the Super Bowl. It's another thing for a guy to tear his ACL while well, just jogging like that. And it was the same knee on the same leg, I believe, as the Achilles that he tore last year. Uh, so there's some thought that maybe it was weakened or susceptible because he was coming back from that. Regardless, I know that there's some, a lot of talk, I should say, about the MetLife uh, stadium turf, going back to when the Niners suffered a bunch of injuries there. I believe it was last year. Um, Odell Beckham now on Twitter last night saying, let's just stop playing on turf, period, and just play on natural grass. So, uh, which is something that the NFLPA and uh, President J.C. Treader has addressed publicly before. Um, so I, I don't sense there's any investigation or anything going on here. It just seems like it's some kind of a fluky thing for Sterling Shepard. As for the Giants, I know that there's frustration or has been frustration uh, with this team the last couple of weeks with that receiving core in that a lot of guys really aren't getting the concepts, aren't getting the timing down. You can figure out who those guys are. Kenny Galladay hasn't been playing much. It'd be fair to put him in that category. One of the guys who was getting things down and was 
uh, picking up the system and was seeing more playing time, I believe, than anybody in that receiving core was Sterling Shepard. So, yeah, this one hurts the Giants. It hurts Daniel Jones, who needs reliable options and needs to find them quickly because he's still under pressure and we still can't get an evaluation. And Ian's coming up because I've spoke, uh, spoken too long here. But, Ian, can we get a read on Daniel Jones? <laughs> can we finally get an offense and some protection around him to feel good about what we think about Daniel Jones? How about now? Should we do it now? Let's do it now. Ian, go. I actually thought Daniel Jones played really well last night. Like, he must be... He did. He is getting well coached. <laughs> like, I, 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 like, he threw it, like, the, the times last year when he didn't throw it away or put the ball at risk, he protected the ball and threw it away last night. I thought he, like, is he the most talented guy on earth? I'm not so sure. And the protection could be better. I thought he's playing well and taking to coaching. There's, like, small positive steps there. The Sterling Shepard thing is, it sucks. And I was there last night, and the scene was bizarre because you had the game ended, you had the middle of the field, both teams converging, you had the Cowboys really happy that they won, you had the fans silent, and then you had Sterling Shepard literally not moving basically to my left on I think the 40 or 35 yard line, and everyone was watching him. And it was really crazy because you could just see the whole stand just watch like what on earth happened to that player who was laying on the turf and not moving. It was haunting, it sucks. Uh, you know what it took, guys, to come back for him. Now, out for, I mean, and, and, you know, we always want to report on these injuries. You knew he was out for the season as soon as it happened. It sucks, and it was terrible to watch. Absolutely no question. Brutal part of this, a, a week three Sunday that had a ton of injuries, too. Honestly, like league-wide as we track those on Sundays, it just felt like there were a lot of high gravity types of things that happened in just sheer volume as well. But the show goes on, as it always does, and the Giants now, a team that was always going to be undermanned this year as Joe Shane and Brian Dable try to install the culture, get the salary cap right, clear out some of those personalities. We'll see if Kenny Galladay is one of them sometime prior to the trade deadline. Was always going to have an uphill battle. Now they have to go without one player who they were actually counting on this season in Sterling Shepard. Uh, by the way, while we were talking there, my watch buzz got a not Twitter notification that Ian had just sent something. So I figured, oh, if he's... If he's tweeting during the insiders, it must be something very important. Uh, LaRaven Clark signed to, off, to the Titans off the Eagles practice squad. That was, um, you had to get that one out right then, huh, Ian? Has, important. Yeah. Has LaRaven Clark played for the, has LaRaven, LaRaven Clark played for Baltimore yet? I feel like he sh he's played for a lot of teams. I feel like he should. <laughs> That'd probably be too confusing. Uh. Well, Ian, that's not the email. What are you doing, by the way, Ian? Why are you why? Raven? No, no, no. I got okay. it. Why, why are you ditching the rest of this yeah. show? Yeah. Just, just real quick, so everyone knows why you're not going to oh, be yes. here when we come back. I gotta go. See you guys later. I'm gonna go see Hamilton for the third time Where are in you my going? life. Okay. Um, I told. Well, yeah, we're going to Broadway, um, and we're gonna get some drinks. We're gonna get some appetizers. We're not going to get dinner uh, because my mom uh, had to go show up a little later, so we're going to take the later train, which is fine. So no dinner, drinks, appetizers, Hamilton, and you guys do the show, and I'll see you later. Put on a nicer shirt. Have a blast. We will see you okay. next time. And quoth LaRaven, nevermore, Ian. Goodbye. We shall return, however, with a lot of the big takeaways from week three in the NFL season. Yes, cover it up. Just get them on the screen. NFL.com every week talks about what we learned from week three. Let's dig in on Lamar Jackson, on Dak Prescott, on Russell Wilson and that Broncos offense. We'll do it all on the other side of this break on the insiders. Tom Pellicero, Two Mike Garofolo back here on the Insiders 2 box because Ian Rappaport has, well, he's left to go gallivanting on Broadway for the evening. We've got more important things to share. Yeah, that's, that's what's left. I'd be careful here because he definitely had to change his shirt before he goes to the Broadway show, so we don't want to have him walk through half naked. Maybe we do. Maybe that's what, uh, that'll get the clicks on the re-air on YouTube, Mike. Okay, so new segment on the show. This was proposed by our producer, Andrew Groover. Um, I'm not the best at explaining new segments, so I'm just going to read what he sent me. Uh, for those not familiar with the series, the What We Learn posts on NFL.com each Monday, our writers and editors break down all the games from week three. Each game gets three to four points each. It has a headline for each point with a paragraph or two to support it. The vanity URL is NFL.com slash what we learned, and I will use their headlines because they are catchy. So here's the first headline that's so catchy we had to put it on your TV right now here, Mike. It is no Dak, 
no problem for the Dallas Cowboys. 2-0 with Cooper Rush as their starting quarterback. Dak Prescott told RJ and Slater at the game last night he thinks he could start as soon as week five against the Rams. Realistically, it might be closer to week six against the Eagles. But either way, he's back sooner than later. Do you buy, if this were a longer absence for Dak Prescott, that Cooper Rush could hold down the fort here? Uh, no, I mean, uh, I, let me check out the phrasing. If, if it were a longer absence, could yeah, because he held down the fort for a couple of weeks now. I mean, I mean, granted, they're not going up against the Chiefs here where you got to get into a shootout. That's a problem, right? You start getting into those games. Cooper Rush is not that guy. Keep the game close, run the football well, play good defense, let him make some of these throws, which are not real, uh, you know, zingers that he's slinging in there. It's just incredible to me. We talk so much. Look at that. That nice touch pass, right? We talk so much around the draft about arm strength. Oh, you got to have arm strength to succeed in this league. And for the most part, it's true because a lot of the stuff that Cooper Rush does, that's hard, right? Look at that. You got to know where that guy's going to be. You got to anticipate it. You got to throw before he makes its move. You got to almost see into the future for where people are going to be. Reminds me of the way that Chad Pennington used to play quarterback for the Jets. He used to throw some balls that that brought rain. They went so high, but it would just be right where it needed to be at the right time. Cooper Rush, uh, you, you got to have a a great knowledge of the system to do that, and he certainly does with a guy in Kellen Moore who he has played for and played with, uh, and a bunch of guys that he's been around for a number of years. He impressed me years ago when he stepped in to be their quarterback in the preseason. I thought, man, this is a guy. This is potentially a guy. Uh, and he's kind of been floating around, got cut, went to the Giants, came back to the Cowboys. I give him all the credit in the world for what he's doing. He's the kind of guy that if you got a couple of games, you're great. If Dak was out for the rest of the season, I wouldn't have great ex expectations for the Cowboys, but he's doing everything he needs to do right now. Cooper Rush was also one of the original hand size guys at the Combine back in, I think it was 2017, where he had measured in at like eight and five eighths inches or something like that at the Senior Bowl, went on YouTube, found some like hand rolling exercises and grew them to nine and one eighths inches uh, before the time he got to the Combine a month later. That's one of the reasons, just the measurables, the arm strength, all that stuff is why he ended up being an undrafted player. And you mentioned it. The Cowboys cut him in Mike McCarthy's first year there. They decided to go with some other quarterbacks instead. Gets picked up by the Giants because Jason Garrett, his old coach with the Cowboys, was there. They cut him, put him on the practice squad, cut him off the practice squad. He's out of football for a month, only gets a job because Dak Prescott suffers that horrific fractured and dislocated ankle. You have to wonder, the parallel universe where we never see Cooper Rush back on or maybe sets out a year, doesn't get in until camp instead. He lands in the perfect situation in Dallas, a valuable member of that team, and now 3-0 and as a starting quarterback. It's a pretty cool story. All right, second headline here from our NFL.com team in the What We Learn story. Lamar's price keeps climbing. Uh, not a lot of question, I don't think, Mike, about that. Ten touchdown passes, two interceptions so far for Lamar. He continues to do just confounding things every week in a good way in terms of the types of plays that he's able to make. What is a Lamar Jackson contract, assuming that everything stays status quo, plays out this year on his fifth-year option, a Lamar Jackson contract he's willing to take, what does that look like come March? Oh, wow. Well, hold on a second. What he's willing to take or, or, or what they're willing to do. I mean, those are two different things. And, you know, I think if, if he was that intent What's it take on, to get it done? If it gets done, what is it? Well, I, well, I think he, if he was that intent on wanting the full guarantees, wanting top of the market money before this season, and then he adds another season on top of that of production and staying healthy and gets himself one year closer to the point where the Ravens can't use franchise tags on him, it's just not going to be feasible at that point, which would be two more years after this one, then I, I think he's still going to demand that. And, and the Ravens got to figure out, do you want to continue to play this dance? Frankly, I, you know, I, I'm okay with it. If I'm the team and next year he's playing on a tag that's pushing $50 million, I mean, he's making money. He's making a ton of money. You're getting a guy who's producing and, and motivated. I think he's... I just think he's the kind of guy that's going to perform no matter what. I, I I don't think he's the kind of guy that once he gets paid would shut it down or go in the tank or anything like that. I just think he's a self-motivated guy. Uh, I don't think it's going to change anything. So if you're the Ravens, you know, hey, look, we're, we're trying to get it done in a traditional quarterback structure. You want to keep doing this, 
fine. And if you get to the point where we have no choice but to do it, then we get to the point where we have no choice but to do it. Um, so I, I just, you know, it, it, if it's somewhere close to that fully guaranteed number, maybe Lamar goes, all right, that's enough. Let's take it. That's good enough. If it's 75% or whatever, I'm just throwing numbers out. Uh, but, you know, with every year you tack on a production and staying healthy, you can start to demand these kinds of things. Well, that, and that's exactly it, Mike, is the leverage point comes from the closer you get to unfettered free agency, which for Lamar is still a couple years away because they can tag him in 23, tag him in 24. He makes a lot of money on those tags, but playing out really two and three quarters more seasons here, is he willing to take that risk? You'd have to argue yes. It doesn't appear that he's all that concerned about the money because almost every other quarterback would have taken the best possible offer regardless of what the guarantees were. He clearly sees the world a little bit differently here. He paid, played for like $3 million last year, and now he's making a little over $20 million for 2022. That is way down the list in terms of quarterback money, and we'll see. I mean, the only thing really that can stop him at this point would be if he gets banged up again like he did at the end of last season when he missed, I think it was the last five games with that bone bruise in his ankle. If all of a sudden teams go, well, this guy plays and he runs and he has this type of a style and two years in a row, at the end of the year, he's wearing down and he's suffering injuries. That's the one thing that could give people pause. But again, the Ravens have made clear what they feel the value is. They're just saying, we're not doing for you what the Browns did for Deshaun Watson, which was far less of a trade than it was actual free agency for Deshaun Watson because he had four or five teams bidding on him and he, they were able to negotiate with everybody. It's just a, it's a different situation. It's one of those ones that every other agent for quarterbacks is looking at right now and trying to figure out, is somebody going to be able to build off that Deshaun Watson contract, which to this point, they haven't been able to. One more headline from the What We Learned column on NFL.com. Broncos offensive woes won't keep turning into Ws. They are, Mike, two and one. For all the talk about everything involving Nathaniel Hackett, probably not that much talk, but maybe there should be more about Russell Wilson not playing particularly well, though he did some of those things we're accustomed to seeing on the final drive the other night. They have won games. They're playing really, really good defense at this point. And if, as Russell Wilson says, they're close to clicking on offense, they still have the makeup of a team that can be dangerous if the quarterback's play elevates as well here. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you immediately, they won't keep turning into W's because they haven't even gotten into their AFC West schedule yet. And you try to start playing like this against those teams, you're probably going to have problems. Now, this weekend, they've got the Raiders in Vegas. That kicks off their AFC West uh, schedule. I, I would uh, suggest that you start scoring more points uh, if you're the Denver Broncos. So, yeah, I, I, I think... Beyond that, they've got the Indianapolis Colts, who I think are going to start to get things together. Then the Chargers at the Chargers. Yeah, these next three games, you better make sure that you guys are on the same page, you're clicking, and Russell Wilson looks like he's been in a system for, you know, five, six, seven years the way he used to look in Seattle rather than right now where he looks like he's trying to figure out what's going on. And here we are heading into week four. It is, it is one of those things, too, that I think everybody should have girded themselves for, which was... How many segments did we do through the whole offseason about the AFC West and all the new additions and the exciting new coaches? And at some point, you got to go, this might take a little bit of time. When you bring in a new head coach and a new quarterback in Denver, or you are bringing in new parts, a new head coach into the Raiders building, or you're making the changes that the Chargers did, adding pieces on defense. Granted, injuries have been a big part of their story so far, but all of a sudden, three weeks in, it's like, what's wrong with all these teams? Well, the Chargers have injuries. The Broncos and the Raiders still look like a team that's figuring out what they're going to be under a new regime. Meanwhile, the Chiefs, I know they lost to the Colts last week, but Patrick Mahomes looks like Patrick Mahomes, and I think that as much as we may have forgotten them through the course of this offseason, that's a team that every week you're going to have to reckon with as you move forward here. We've got a few headlines to get to coming up on the other side of this break. Also, more uh, Lil Uzi Vert uh, commentary for Mike because I know he really wants to dive into Hi, that. Ian. And Ian, still not back, but also not naked on TV. So you win some, lose some. We'll be back with Ian Saunders. We talked about all those injuries the Chargers have been dealing with recently. The Buffalo Bills, Mike, have also had some pretty significant injuries hit them, especially in the secondary. They got a notable veteran name in the building today. Tell us about it. 
Xavier Rhodes. Uh, <laughs> somebody, <laughs> somebody sent us a good? video. Get over there. So I just, it's good. Yeah, it's 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 not it's nothing it's nothing offensive or anything, but it's just you know. One time somebody sent us like the world's worst one during free agency, and I. <laughs> oh, I remember. I'm watching. It. I, I, I'm watching it on silent. I remember. I'm watching it on silent. It's, <laughs> yeah, I've seen it before. It's and you fun. were yeah, anyway. You, were, you could not. You could not. Yeah, yeah. Go this ahead. is this Go one's ahead. not Tell as about, funny, but it. it just X it Xavier. Just me, it's, it's X. You pronounce, you pronounce the X. You pronounce yeah. the X, Nick Xavier. So go for it. Yeah. Uh, throw up the X. Pronounce the X. Xavier, uh, Zav, not Xavier Howard. <laughs> Xavier Rhodes X is Xavier. in Buffalo meeting with the Bills today. X Xavier. <laughs> you just told me that. He told me to do it, and I didn't do it. Uh, X Xavier Rhodes meeting with the Buffalo Bills. Yeah, Tre'Davious White. Still coming back uh, from that season-ending in knee injury uh, a year ago. Uh, Dane Jackson has uh, had that scary injury last year, or last week, excuse me. We're still waiting to see him uh, and whether he might be able to return in short order. So the Buffalo Bills saying, yeah, we need some help back there, and this is a Super Bowl-ready roster. You can't have enough cornerbacks, period, regardless of who's healthy. So let's see if Xavier Rhodes ends up with the Buffalo Bills. Uh, spent the last two years with the Colts. Still has some good football left. Could be an interesting signing. X Xavier. X Xavier. I'll never forget it again. A uh, couple other injury notes. I might. Lions wide receiver Amon Ross St. Brown. You might have seen him limp off the field in Minnesota on Sunday. Got his ankle retaped. I'm told he had tests on it on Monday. The results of those tests were largely encouraging. He potentially could miss some time here. Lions have their bye coming up in a couple of weeks, but not expected to be anything long-term. They also, quite possibly, could be without their running back, DeAndre Swift. He suffered a shoulder sprain in that same game, so much like a year ago, Lions are going to have to find a way to try to win with without some of their key players. And for the Steelers who have the Jets on Sunday, Minka Fitzpatrick in concussion protocol. That is going to be one to watch because we have seen that Steelers team, they are not consistent right now in terms of their offense. They are struggling to rush the passer. The strength that they have is in the secondary, and Mink is a, a massive, massive part of that. Uh, before we go, Joe Burrow, Bengals quarterback, you might have heard of him, uh, said today Kid Cuddy texted him and said that he named a song after Joe Burrow on his new album. So I ask you this, Mike Garofolo, who would you want to write a song about you? Hmm. It's a pretty good one. Uh, who are the great songwriters of our generation? Neil Diamond was pretty good. Neil Diamond can write a song. Let me tell you that. He can, he can spin a yarn. Uh, Neil writing a lot? Maybe Carol King? writing a lot these days? No, no, he's not writing a lot, and I won't get really? into that. Um, but, you know, yeah, Carol, Carol King was a good... I, see, I'm, I'm more like classic rock songwriters, so I'd probably go back to that generation. So that's, that's where I am. You're going a ways back there, for sure. Meanwhile, yeah. here in 2022, you can catch great shows like this on the NFL channel across all of the fast streaming platforms. You can read it down there, 24-7 live stream, your favorite shows, classic game broadcasts. I watched the 1993 Chiefs-Broncos game recently on the NFL channel. Go to nfl.com slash NFL channel. Get it there, or you find it on your favorite. I, I didn't make it to the end, but it was a great, it was a great first half. I did watch it. I was working out, and then I, I stopped working out. I mean, I figured I could Google it later. It was Joe Montana versus John Elway. It was great. It was shots oh, of Paul Monta Hackett. It was a Monday Daniel night Dan game. In the coaching booth. If it's a Monday night game, Montana won that game. It was a comeback. Was that 93? Yeah, that probably was that game. I had the sound off, too. Yeah. So, But everything Maybe. about watching it with the sound off for half the game uh, was pretty good. Pluto TV, Peacock, Tubi, Vizio. You can find it everywhere. We are streaming this show live. Or not live, but, you know, live enough. Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, every week through the hey, NFL bring season. bring up the three box again. Can, <laughs> can, we get, can we get the three box? There you go. You can stream it on the NFL Stay app. Ian. Ian's probably going to be watching it on the way back on YouTube.com slash NFL. I deserve this. Just for Ian and Mike, I'm Tom Pellicero. See ya.